Hello and welcome to the video. It's the Chess on Toast game of the day from the FIDE Candidates Tournament running currently in London. My name's Nick Murphy. With me, as always, International Master Lauren De Costa. So Lauren, we're in round six now. What game are we going to look at? We're going to look at another Magnus Carlsen game. And guess what? He won yet again. And, <laughs> so this uh, is our third Magnus Carlsen game? It is indeed. And I think this is the third time that we've actually seen him win. Um, is that true, Nick? Yes, he's got three draws and three wins so far. Um, Co-leader with Levon Aronian, who of course himself is playing very well. But as we've seen, Carlsen with 4 and a half out of 6 against such this level of opposition is still playing kind of par for the course, isn't he? He certainly is, yeah. So the game he, uh, we're going to look at today is his game against Peter Svidler. Six-time Russian chess champion Svidler, so he's no mug. And here we see him with the white pieces actually losing. Now, normally at top-level chess... White doesn't lose so often with the white pieces, so any black victory is treated with uh, great respect, even if it is Carlson. And the game followed e4, e5, which is something that us here at Chess on Toast are quite familiar with, aren't we, Nick? Yeah, we've looked at that in a few different DVDs. And the following moves, let's see what happens, because uh, we covered the Shuko Piano, Evans Gambit, and all these other different gambits. Was one of them played? And the answer is... No, he wasn't. What, what <laughs> opening was, it, was played here? Okay, so that is um, that's the Roy Lopez. I think we've talked about that in a in a game of the day video, haven't we? That's right. Actually, it was one of Carlson's early games, wasn't it, against Alexander Grishuk? Yeah. And here he was actually white um, in that variation, and black played the immediate move knight to f6. So if you care to have a look at that video from one of the early rounds, and that one we talked about, black was trying to play what's called the Berlin defense by taking on e4 and then retreating this knight to d6. May not make a lot of sense, but if you go back to that video, we will explain all, or have explained all there. Yeah, we talked about the ideas on that one, so go back and check that out after you watch this one. So the main line was played by Carlson himself, so he obviously does his homework, uh, being the world number one, and he played the main line pawn to a6. And White replied with bishop a4, and this is the kind of the main line of the Spanish or the Royal Lopez. Right. So again, we talked about why White could, of course, take the knight, and then we showed that trick again in the earlier uh video that we did about we did. this idea where black brings the queen out to attack these two pieces and this is basically completely fine for black of course there's more to it than that like there isn't any chess opening but that's what we're going to leave at right here because we're going to study now the move bishop a4 so the bishop avoids being captured of course and yes black can play this move b5 which we're going to see happen quite soon in the game in fact black could play it here and it doesn't really change anything except to prevent white from taking the knight. Well, we've seen that isn't the most dangerous idea, so black shouldn't really be too bothered about that. Okay. So instead, Carlson just decided to play knight f6, which is, you know, one of those standard moves. You bring yep. the knight out towards the centre, of course, and you do an attacking pawn, uh, attacking the pawn on e4 like this. Looks like a very sensible move. That's right. Now, white could, of course, play d3, which I believe is very similar to what Carlson played against Grishuk, and those are kind of what we call the sort of slower variations in the Royal Lopez. Because in the Royal Lopez, White normally likes to play this idea of C3 and D4, very similar to the Zhuko Piano lines, isn't That's it? That's right, yeah, we talked about that in an earlier DVD. That's right, and White tries to, to concentrate the pawn on D4 there and attack in one go with the pawn on D2 to D4, as we see there in the green arrow. But instead, after castles, Bishop E7, White now just played D3 anyway. So it's going to bring about this kind of slower variation as we talked about. The main line in this position is to play rook e1, and that defends the pawn in this manner, doesn't it? Yep. And that doesn't lo uh, move the d-pawn, because white is not interested in pushing it one square. White would like to push it two squares. So, for example, if we play castles, white could now play c3 and attempt to play d4. In fact, if I just go back, probably that's a mistake by black, because white can now play bishop takes c6 and knight takes e5. What do you think the difference is by white playing it now rather than a few moves ago? Um, do you have an extra pawn now or no? We do, but why can't black do that queen d4 trick attacking the two pieces now? What's oh, because it's not actually attacking the, the pawn on e4 at all now because the, the rook is defending it. But isn't white, isn't black attacking it twice and it's only being defended once? So Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nick here is our resident club player. Well, if you don't know, then it definitely needs explaining, doesn't okay. it? Well, the idea is that although black's attacking it with two pieces and it's only being defended once... White, of course, can play knight to f3. Right. And black is attacking the pawn twice, 
but white is counter-attacking the queen here. And is black really going to play queen takes e4 in you, this position? No, because then you'd lose the queen to the rook and you'd be down material, so you'd have to really move the queen out of the way. But if we move the queen out of the way, then white can just play a sensible move. And guess what? We've won an extra pawn. Oh, yes, and I see. Yep. I remember myself back when, a very long time ago, I'm not too old, but when uh, <laughs> I was a, a young beginner learning the ropes, and I definitely remembered a game where I lost this e5 pawn here, I'll put it in yellow, and I ended up losing a pawn end game just because I lost that pawn. So there's no way that black should ever allow white to capture that pawn for absolutely nothing, as we see in this right. position. So if I just go back after rook e1, black should actually play b5 here. And this is the timely moment for, for black to play this, because after bishop b3, then we can castle. Yep. And black's knight does a great job of defending the pawn on e5. Does that make sense? It does make sense, yes. So uh, a lot of ifs and buts there. Um, and again, white could play something like c3, which explain, which we've already explained, haven't yeah. we? Because white wants to play d4. But this allows black to play... I mean, I couldn't possibly try to explain all the variations black can do. But the main one, which um, Carlson and uh, Levon Aronian himself uses quite a lot, as does Svidler as black, actually, is to play the martial gambit with d5. So um, this is something that all the players, the top players in the world, are all aware of. Even someone like Kramnik, who plays d4 move one. Would, uh, they're all aware of this kind of variation because it's a very kind of topical and aggressive line that black tries to use. So that explains why in this position, Svidler as white just settled for the modest move d3. Right. So he's not interested in allowing any of that black nonsense with the uh, the martial gambit. And instead just to try, you know, to kind of play Carlson in a proper game of chess. Man, mano a uh, mano, I would say. <laughs> in a terrible accent there, by the way. Anyway, so now black played b5. Do you think black could castle in this position, Nick? Um... Can, yes. we, can white get away with doing this idea? Um, well, you could... If you then took the knights, you could get the pawn, I think. Yeah. Come on, club player. Does it look safe? Does it look safe? Um, can we get away with it in the same very... Well, the same ilk as yes, we had we earlier? Yes, we can, because if the queen then comes into d4, the knight can just retreat. It's not... The pawn's not being attacked at all. Exactly, yeah. The pawn on e4 is being defended by its counterpart. And now we see that black is again just the clear pawn down, and the queen would have to move again, won't it? Yeah. So really kind of not that great for black. So, returning to the position after d3, that explains why Carlson now played b5. Again, of course being the world number one, or respected grandmaster, he knows when black should go b5, and when black should not go b5. So b5 of course attacking the bishop, but it does more than that, doesn't it? Because it prevents white's potential action on the knight, doesn't it? Yeah. And therefore watching out for the e5 pawn. So to the club player, although we've only talked about a few moves here, it's really, really important you understand that you must not lose that pawn um, unless you do it for a certain reason, like the martial gambit, as we saw earlier. It's amazing that just moving a pawn at the side, like that b pawn, depending on what time you move it, the different consequences. Exactly. I mean, we always talk about castling, but in this position, castling would be a mistake, wouldn't it? Because yeah. we would lose, lose the pawn. That pawn. So, so back to d3, and Carlson played b5. Bishop b3. And now he played d6. So um, he could have just castled here. And probably Swiller would play something like rook e1. I mean, white could play c3 here. But he's not really threatening d d2 to d4 now, is he? Because no. he's moved the pawn. So white will just consider the typical Roy Lopez maneuver, which is to play rook e1, yep. knight to d2, yep. and bring the knight round to the f1 square. Have you ever okay. seen that idea before? Yeah, I've, to I've, I've seen it. I mean, it's, it seems like you're moving the knight a lot, but it kind of makes sense. Does the knight even sometimes want to come up to f5 and things like that? Oh, much later in the game, absolutely, yeah, yeah to try and attack. So there is an idea behind it. At the first glance, it looks like you're just sort of wasting time, but That's there, is, right. there is a plan. That's right. So after bishop b3, d6, um, it's actually d6 is quite a subtle little move, because if white now plays something like h3, which looks absolutely fine. Looks like a good move. This is, again, something that I fell for when I was, I don't know, 1,600 rated, I think. Um, my opponent realised that because the black pawn defends its counterpart on e5, the knight on c6 can move. And now he played knight a5. And the problem for white is that the bishop is being attacked. Yes, the knight is worth the same as the bishop. But in the Spanish or the Royal Lopez, white absolutely wants to keep that bishop on b3. At all. He doesn't want to swap it off for that knight on a5. So now the bishop has nowhere to go, does it? No, you're going to have you're going to lose the bishop for the knight. That's right. So again, not um, losing any points 
but losing the kind of like the, the crown jewels of White's position, which yeah, is that so it, bishop. It doesn't mean you're instantly going to lose the game. It's not like a massive blunder, but it kind of is against the whole point of the the opening that you've played. That's right. White kind of relies on that bishop there on b3 and yellow. So after d6, the natural reaction is White needs to play. Normally, White plays c3, um, which is completely fine here, of course. But Swindler decides to play a4, and that also does a good job of um, allowing the bishop to retreat to a2. So if Black now considered knight a5. Um, above anything else, white can just simply retreat bishop a2. Yeah. And then we get to keep that uh, that bishop on that nice line uh, diagonal towards f7, doesn't he? And we certainly do. So that's one other thing to think about. When black plays d6, black is defending the pawn on e5. Watch out for this knight a5 manoeuvre. It's quite a nice little idea for both sides to be aware of. So that explains why, black, why white played a4. So again, I'm taking some time to explain... The kind of manoeuvring, or you know, we haven't. We, neither side has actually captured anything, have they? No. But I think it's important to realise, you know, the ins and outs of this variation because um, e4, e5 is a very popular opening at all levels, as we see at the top level here, yep. as we see in your games, Nick, at the lowest level, and <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, I think these kind of points are quite quite important to know. So Carlson played b4, not the only move, but uh, clearly Black cannot castle because um, because if you took the pawn on b5. You can't take it back with the other pawn because then you just lose your rook. Excellent. So black could, of course, go somewhere like bishop b7, but Carlson's not sure whether he wants that bishop on that long diagonal. So, uh, I mean, that's absolutely fine, of course. But instead he played b4, and white played knight d2. Castles, a5. Now, a5 is one of those moves you might think, well, you know, why does he need to do that? To, to um, me, it looks sort of pointless, but... Well, this is all given, I believe, in Neil Macdonald's book on the uh, Play the D3 Lopez. Is Neil Macdonald, Neil? English Grandmaster. Yeah. Um, and I think this is in that uh, book. Um, and the idea of A5 is to stop black going A5 and kind of bring this knight to C4. And maybe white can do really annoying moves like bishop A4 and bring in that bishop to attack the knight again. I see. So it's yeah. kind of... And also it prevents black from doing that knight A5 business, doesn't it? Yeah. So all in all, quite a sensible little move. Bishop e6 and knight c4. So the point of knight c4, we talked about that idea of white going knight f1 to g3, didn't yeah. we? And bring it around this way. But now the point of knight c4 is, and Neil explains this in his book very nicely, black's pawn break. Uh, do you remember what a pawn break was, Nick? Yeah, so pushing that pawn into the centre to sort of uh, open up lines. And That's right. Like that. Black wants to go d5, doesn't he? Oh. But now d5 would be weak. Because the knight can now capture that key Attacked pawn e5. By both knights and, many... and only defended by one knight. That's right. And how many times have we talked about that pawn e5 yeah. already in the first 10 minutes of this video? So, knight c4 is kind of a preventative measure. And also, finally, it defends the pawn on a5. So, so rook b8. Um, and black realizes what white's going to play next, which is c3. Because if we don't go there, how on earth are we going to play d4? Right. But of course, the b file comes open. So now black's rook. Op operates right down this open line again it's not really threatening anything at the moment but as you'll see can be quite dangerous it's for always white. a good thing to have your rook on an open file isn't that's it? right h6 one of those club player moves isn't it you know watch out for back rank checkmates Stop i would, I would play that move you're like carlson and are you <laughs> for one move for one like, move you're like carlson okay. i like to think so that i play the same <laughs> moves as magnus carlson at for least one once move. at least once yeah what on the first move and the 13th move as well. That's twice. That's even better. <laughs> so rookie one, again, trying to stop black going there because white will capture on d5 and open up the rook towards that key pawn on e5. Right. So queen c8. Oh, excuse me. Queen c8. Uh, both sides kind of do this manoeuvring phrase here. Um, both sides kind of jostling their pieces around bishop f8. This is a kind of... It's not one of those, you know, I want to start again moves. Um, by bringing the bishop back to its starting square. It's just protecting the black king, isn't it? So it's very sensible. Sort of, uh, yeah, adding to the defence of the black king. That's right. And also, if black wants to go d5, which you'll see is what he really wants to do, he's just kind of getting out of the way of that e-file, isn't he? Which, you know, could yeah. be a problem for that bishop in the future. And is he, I mean, uh, this might be just a guess, but is he even opening up the e7 square so that knight on c6 could move there if it needs to at some point? Uh, it could do as well. So, you know, that's not yeah. the most important feature, but it is an, an extra idea. It's, a, it's so another possibility. It's, 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 yeah. a, it's a 1500 rated idea. Um, <laughs> to play this knight e7. I mean, actually, it's not because grandmasters do this maneuver all the time. So I'll give that's you a bit more was, respect. That's yeah. what I was thinking. And uh, White played knight e3. Well, I mean, maybe he just thought that Carlson was going to go d5 anyway. So after knight e3, Carlson took, you know, no, didn't need any second invitation to go d5. The pawn break. So. You know, he's playing very logical moves, isn't he, Black? Yeah. 
um, despite being the world number one, you think he comes comes up with all this fantastic kind of really complicated ideas, but actually he's just playing very typical strategic ideas. Get your pieces out, castle early, do a pawn break to open up the position, and uh, that's exactly what he's done. So white swapped, black took with the knight, and a lot of the pieces came off. Notice that white now cannot go bishop b3, because no. that rook on b8 is uh, monitoring proceedings on that square. h3, again, trying to copy black's idea of, well, if I haven't got a useful move, I'll just stop any back rank check mates. But now we see black's pieces come forward, and very similar to the, uh, you know, it's quite ironic, similar to the Carlson Grishik game where Carlson is white, we saw this idea of black playing bishop f5 to attack the pawn d3. Yeah. Um, but there, it didn't work. I mean, maybe Carlson has this magic wand where whichever side of the, of the board he is, it just <laughs> seems to work for him. But I mean, uh, um, so here, it feels as though White's quite passive now because he's got to defend that square, hasn't he? Yeah. So we say that this bishop is now tied down to the defence of the pawn. Seems so, like a bit of a lowly job for a bishop. Just It is indeed. Yeah. Um, rook d1, queen e6. Um, just bringing the pieces now forward and possibly allowing black to play rook d8 so suddenly out of nowhere Carlson's you know taken charge of the position doesn't yeah, he yeah. Um, and that's that's the genius of his play notice at any moment black can snaffle this pawn up on a5 yeah. not interested at the moment I'll just show you why if he plays rook takes a5 now um, he could have done it in this position actually rook takes a5 white could now swap his a pawn for the lovely e pawn and you always even though it's a pawn for a pawn I'd say that that e pawn is much more important than White's useless e pawn there. Right. So um, Carlson not interested in that, and uh, they go through another manoeuvring phase. Bishop b1. He's trying to play bishop a2, and do some nasty over here. Queen d7. Just because he went backwards doesn't mean he's made a mistake. I mean, the bishop on b1 is now not very good because White cannot consider this d4 pawn break because now his bishop would be un unprotected, wouldn't yeah. it? Um, well, it's being protected, but it's being attacked twice, isn't yeah. it? Especially protected by one piece and attacked by two That's pieces. That's right. So, really, not that, not such a gain for White. And after Bishop e3, we now see the drawback of this Bishop on b1, because the Rook is not connected to its other Rook. And this allowed Black to play the crushing e4 with a pin down here. So, Bishop b1, as we saw, seemed like a gain of a move, but actually it's more detrimental to White's position than, right. it, than it helps. So, um... E4, now white cannot take the pawn on E4 because of the rook on D1, so he went knight D4, and Carlsen swapped, and it appeared that after all the exchanges that he has a lovely pin down here, so how can you attack the bishop on D4 with a piece of lower value than the bishop? Um, you could attack the bishop by moving the pawn to C5. Good. Now most club players would think, uh-oh, I've just blundered, haven't I? Uh, looks, because, fairly, uh, looks like, um, yeah, black's winning. Though, because of this lovely pin. But, of course, Svidlo must have seen further, and of course he had. He played bishop e5 with a counter-attack on ah, to the rook nice. on b8. So instead, yes, he's not um, just going to lose that piece, because he's also going he would capture the other rook. And also, he spotted, from a few moves um, in advance, that black cannot now play rook takes e5, because if rook takes d7, rook takes e2 leaves black a piece ahead. But in fact, he can play queen takes e5... And if black takes the rook, it appears black's a piece ahead, but what can white do now? Oh, white can now take the other rook. Yeah, so white um, can actually take the rook. So a bit of geometry there um, shows the tactical awareness of both players there. So Carlsen avoiding that variation because he could see that, and Svidler playing bishop e5 because he could see it as well. So um, kind of hidden moves there. And I actually thought black could play rook e8 here. You know, we talked about this before the game. Uh, pin pinning the bishop pinning to the, the queen. Pinning the bishop to the queen. But actually, it allows white to play rook e3. And there is no more danger, and black and white seems to have escaped. So Carlson instead played rook takes d3, bishop takes b8, but now c4. And an excellent strategy from Carlson, because what he's done now, he's an, he's allowed the bishop to come out. And even though black only has three major pieces on the board, if we said that black could go rook d2, bishop c5, and attack down towards the f2 square, suddenly white's position isn't so rosy. Right. And as we see, excellent kind of grandmaster strategy. He's put his pawns on opposite colour to the black to its own bishop, hasn't he? Yeah. In fact, that was Philidor who said that back, I don't know, in 1760, I believe. He said, "Put your pawns on the opposite colour square of your bishop, so your bishop can go in and out." So these and here good, we see, yeah, good Carlson. ideas from hundreds of years ago, still applicable now. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Although they wouldn't have written on their iPads, they would have written <laughs> on scrolls or something, wouldn't they? Um, bishop e5, White desperately tries to go back, and if he can go bishop d4 now. I think White's position would be in order, but Carlson 
It's never going to allow that. And he went bishop c5. And now white's under a little bit of pressure here because rook d2 is coming with a skewer across to f2. Um, not that easy for white to deal with this. Um, you know, maybe white can consider something like queen g4. Threatening checkmate and trying to stop off queens. But after queen takes and f6, bishop moves somewhere. Oops. Oh, actually, yeah, we could play rook takes g3 there. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, um, so. so maybe something like bishop f4, but then rook takes c3, and now black's in the driving seat. Yeah. So queen stop, no good for white. So you play rook b1, finally getting the rook into the game. But it's amazing that the game ends in just a few moves here, doesn't he? Um, still this threat of rook d2. So white launched a kind of aggressive attack here. Um, actually, this was a really, really clever move here. Okay, and it looks as though black could do rook d2, right? But now white can do an absolute corker of a tactic, which is something that, you know, I'd actually advise the uh, viewer to pause it here and see white to play and win in this position. I'm, I'm go I think I've got it. I mean, surely, because I say, surely Svidler could not believe that Carlson would fall for this, but can Ooh. you tell everybody what it is? Cause right, let me see if I've got this right. Maybe I'll, do you want to give me a clue? There. Yes, I know. I was going to say, bring the rook to h8, because that's check, and you have to take it. It's the only move you've got left now. But now, if the queen takes the pawn on h6... Wow, the club player's the in business bishop. here. <laughs> well, you've told me there was a tactic to look for. That helps. It always helps when you're looking at a board if someone points out there is a tactic available. Indeed. And, of course, now you can just take the pawn, and that's checkmate. An amazing tactic, look at that. If we just say queen h5, actually threaten devastation on h8. Um, amazing, isn't it? But Carlson, um, well, he just avoided that. He went queen e4. I mean, it's a ridiculously calm move, that is. Because now with rook h8, he's just calculated that after king takes, it's not checkmate because I can oh, go here. Nice. And, and, well, okay, white can go bishop takes g7, but king g8 and black's a rook ahead, and that's the end of that. Wow. I mean, it's such a calm move in such a pressure situation, and this, yeah. you know he's playing one of the best players. Okay, you can see this tactic, but most of us would probably well start to panic in this one position. Of the, one of the oh, maybe I should check, or <laughs> maybe I should. I don't know what am I going to do in this position. You could check and maybe swap off queens with this idea, but you know Carlson, unbelievably cool in this position. Queen e4. I mean, to see that tactic and then just take a deep breath and go, yeah, actually I can deal with it in such a ridiculous way like this. So rook b2, trying to defend this uh, second rank. Um, but now the rook switch back, you know, because the queen vacated the d5 square. Now, out of nowhere, white black has taken advantage of this pin. Wow. So um, rook e2, um, queen b1 check, king here. White's fighting really hard, but after f6, he was compelled to resign because he's now going to lose this bishop on e5. So, uh, you know... It's amazing that uh, a club player might have actually checkmated White a few moves ago, but in fact it's White who's lost three moves later. <laughs> so, um, yeah, great play from both players, but I think Carlson remarkably calm under pressure, and that's one of the reasons why he's the world's best player at the moment, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, we keep saying this. You know, He's demonstrating just exactly why he is uh, the highest rated chess player in the history of the game. Well, there we go. That's another fantastic game. That was round six. Uh, thank you very much for that, Lauren. And thank you for watching the video. We'll be back uh, very soon with another video from the London FIDE Candidates Tournament. If you want to know more about Chess on Toast, check us out at www.chessontoast.com. But from us for today, we'll see you soon again and goodbye.